The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good afternoon. We're here to talk about what makes neighborhoods change. We'll use the evaluation of the Neighborhood Stabilization Program as the springboard for our discussion. The evaluation focused on what happened to neighborhoods during an economic downturn, but it has broader implications for interventions that try to change neighborhood trajectories. My name is Jill Kaduri. I'm a senior fellow at APT Associates, a global research company that conducted the NSP evaluation for the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development. With me as panelists for this webinar are three people who have done a great deal of thinking, research, and writing about the dynamics of neighborhoods and about interventions to help neighborhoods recover from distress. Jenny Schutz is an economist in the Consumer and Community Affairs Division of the Board of Governors of the Federal Reserve System. Prior to joining the Fed, she was a faculty member at the University of Southern California and was a senior member of the research team that evaluated NSP. Alan Malik is a senior fellow at the Center for Community Progress in Washington, D.C. A city planner, advocate, and writer, his books include Bringing Buildings Back from, a, from Abandoned Properties to Community Assets. Alan was a member of the study's expert panel. And then we'll have um, Carolina Reed, who is an assistant professor in the Department of City and Regional Planning at the University of California, Berkeley. Carolina specializes in housing and community development with a specific focus on access to credit and the impact of foreclosures on low-income and minority communities. Each of us will speak for a few minutes. Then I'll ask questions of the three panelists. You can submit a question you'd like me to ask by following the instructions on this screen. The question box should be on the right of the screen. You can type in a question at any time during this webinar. So before we open this up to the panelists, I'm going to give you a brief overview of the program and the evaluation. NSP was a large program, a federal grant program intended to overcome the effects of the foreclosure crisis specifically the effects on neighborhoods. The idea was that foreclosures can have a contagion effect, putting neighborhoods into a downward spiral. The evaluation focused on the second round of NSP grants, known as NSP2. Grantees were chosen competitively based on demonstrated capacity in the community development field. They were supposed to concentrate their investments to increase the likelihood that those investments would make a difference. That was a bit different from NSP-1, the first round of grants, which was allocated by formula. Now, the evaluation has a wealth of detail on the implementation of the NSP-2 program and on specific topics, such as the effect of the program on crime rates. Uh, we won't be able to cover everything today, but if you're interested in reading the report, this slide has a link to the report on HUDUser.org. This slide shows how NSP2 grantees in the 19 counties that were part of the study spent the money. The counties provide a good mix of market conditions, and together they cover a very large share of all of NSP2 funding. Most of the effort was on acquiring, rehabbing, or redeveloping residential properties, um, although you'll see that in terms of numbers of properties affected, simple demolition was a major activity. 44% of all of the treated properties were just demolished. On the other hand, as you can see from the dollar column on the slide, very large amounts um, of grant funds were spent on acquisition and rehab and on redevelopment. Not surprisingly, grantee approaches, the mix of these different activities, varied considerably by communities. Uh, those variations could be based on the strength of housing markets and on what the grantees thought work, um, or sometimes they were based on existing plans or pre-existing plans for neighborhood revitalization. The evaluation measured impacts, or spillovers, in this case we mean positive spillovers that were intended to result from NSP2 investments. 
Those spillovers were measured on a variety of outcome measures. They were measured at the census tract level using carefully chosen comparison census tracts, and some were measured for houses close to the properties that got NSP2 investments. So what did the evaluation find? Well, the evaluation found very few impacts on house prices or on other measures such as vacancy rates. The panelists are going to talk more about why they think that was the case. Here I'm just going to give you a few observations that are up there on the slide and that were made by the research team as they um, um, assessed what they found. First of all, despite the overall size of the grant program, it was dwarfed by the problems of the target neighborhoods. This was particularly the case for neighborhoods that had been declining for decades. Second, despite the intention of the program to concentrate resources, there was little evidence that grantees were able to do that. On average, only seven properties received investments in each tract. The properties often were scattered across the tract um, um, rather than concentrating in a particular part of the census tract. Another reason was that the study found um, um, or another reason that the study found that there were no impacts of NSP investments may be that the selection of properties to treat was more opportunistic for strategic. Um, first, there were pressures to spend the money fast, and second, competition from private investors. Grantees often weren't able to compete with private purchasers of foreclosed properties. Because of that, and because they were faced with expenditure deadlines, they often treated properties to which they already had access rather than recent foreclosures. Um, yet another reason uh, that um, is that uh, little impacts were found um, is that uh, house price changes, which were one of the key impact measures, um, went in different directions or logically um, went in different directions. Demolishing a property reduced the supply and could lead to price increases for nearby properties. On the other hand, rehabbing and redeveloping a property and returning it to the market can depress nearby property values. And finally, not all of the program activity, especially for rehab and redevelopment, was complete at the time of the study. So it is possible that the study was done too early to detect effects of NSP2 that may actually have happened. So now I'm going to... Um, turn this over to Jenny, who did some of the most sophisticated analysis for the study when she was part of the study team. Jenny? Thanks, Jill. And before I start my substantive remarks, I need to clarify that everything I'm going to say today is entirely my own opinion and does not represent the policy or opinions of the Board of Governors of the Federal Reserve System or any other staff in the Federal Reserve System. Uh, we have been trying to figure out sort of the larger lessons from NSP, given that we don't uh, anticipate necessarily the same economic circumstances or same policy uh, happening again. And I think one of the, the larger lessons is probably not new, but worth remembering. It's really difficult to change the trajectory of neighborhoods through policy interventions, particularly in the face of par powerful market forces and very long-term trends. So most of the neighborhoods that received investment through NSP had been distressed even before the recession began. Some of them had been in decline for decades, losing population and housing values. And so we have to be realistic about one policy and a relatively small amount of money can do in a short space of time to turn around these very long-term uh, declining neighborhoods. Um, and in general, the neighborhoods that recovered the fastest were the ones that hadn't been hit as hard and that had stronger fundamentals before the recession um, even hit. I think the second larger lesson is that there's a big gap between the way policies are designed um, and the way HUD, in this case, anticipated that it would be carried out and the way it was actually implemented. Um, and not at all through the fault of either HUD or the grantees, but the economic circumstances made it very difficult to implement NSP the way it was intended. So the program, particularly the second round, was really intended to do these very strategic, concentrated investments to pick the properties that would have the most impact on surrounding neighborhoods and to cluster investments to get a critical mass. In practice, because of these constraints that Jill talked about, competition from investors um, in a very short time period to, uh, to spend the money, 
it was really difficult for most grantees to strategically target the investments, and so it wound up diffusing the, prop, the money um, fairly widely, and that likely diminished the effect that could have happened. And again, this wasn't necessarily foreseeable, but in retrospect, we can understand why this was really difficult to implement the way it was intended. We um, looked at the implementation of NSP across 19 different counties with very, very different housing markets. And certainly there was an extent to which the, the local housing market conditions mattered, in particular kind of strategies that grantees chose. So for instance, the grantees um, in declining markets in Detroit and Cleveland focused mostly on demolishing properties because they knew that they had long-term population decline. Grantees in stronger housing markets, particularly on the East Coast and the West Coast, anticipated continued demand for affordable housing and so spent most of their resources on rehabilitation or redevelopment to increase the affordable housing stock in the long run. So to that extent, the housing market conditions mattered. But I think even more so, the goals and capacity of the grantees really determined how effective they were. Many of the grantees did not have experience doing these kinds of activities before and had to staff up and learn what they were doing, which was particularly difficult given the short time period of the program. And we saw enormous differences in the number of properties, the cost per property, and the time required to complete this activity, and the ability to do strategic investment across different grantee organizations within very similar housing markets. And so it's worth remembering that the, the staff capacity uh, and leadership and ability to utilize resources really matters a lot uh, for this kind of policy. In terms of future kinds of resources, uh, HUD certainly has spent some time thinking about this. What are the incentives built into the program for using resources efficiently? Um, the short time frame to spend money down probably didn't encourage the most efficient and most strategic use of resources. Grantees had to spend it quickly rather than spending it in the um, location with maximum effect. Um, similarly, when thinking about the program design, there are trade-offs between giving grantees flexibility to adapt to local conditions versus HUD being able to control what they were doing and maybe have some more oversight and accountability. Um, you know, I think one example of this is why was Detroit spending money doing rehabilitation when they knew that they had excess housing stock, right? So putting more uh, restrictions on the grantees may make it more difficult to do things, but if HUD has very specific goals to accomplish, that may be easier for them to control where the money gets spent and how it's spent. And I think finally, the, um, the program was really intended as a short-term triage for neighborhoods that were bleeding, that were in immediate trouble and that needed to kind of stem the, the, uh, the growth of foreclosures and try to introduce stability in a very unstable time. But realistically, a lot of the activities are things that are more likely to show long-term impacts. Rehabilitating or redeveloping a, a property may take several years to do, and then it may take several years beyond that for the impacts really to get capitalized into the remaining neighborhood. And so it's worth thinking about if you need to have an, inter, an immediate intervention, whether in fact these kinds of activities are the appropriate ones, if we think of this as a long-term investment in communities that need the investment and aren't getting it from other locations, we may have a different view of the success of NSP. Thank you, Jenny. Now we'll go to Alan Malik. I think we will. Well. Yeah. Well, I'd like to sort of pick up from what Jenny said and talk somewhat more broadly about the whole issue of what drives neighborhood change and how this relates to what happened or didn't happen with NSP. And I have a metaphor I've started to use that too often we think of, or act as if we think of, neighborhood change or neighborhoods kind of like a vending machine, which have very predictable outcomes relative to inputs. You put in four quarters, you push the right button, a Coke bottle or Coke can comes out in the bin at the bottom. And so we tend to want to think, and I think we do a lot of research that sort of confirms this approach, that individual interventions lead to predictable outcomes in neighborhoods. And I think that's really not a very good model. We really have to think of neighborhoods much more as 
holistic systems where the outcome of interventions has as much to do with how those interventions change people's perception of the neighborhoods, people's behavior, and talking both about people inside and outside the neighborhood, rather than just how the interventions affect the physical conditions. Clearly, physical conditions affect behavior, but they do so in very uneven, very variable, and very complicated pathways. So when you look at NSP, I think that was the threshold issue, that people were trying to embark on a single type of intervention in a very complicated situation, as Jenny pointed out, where in many cases decline had been a long-term and large-scale phenomenon. On top of that, one basic fallacy, because I think the idea was, in fact, to stem the bleeding, but the fact is, at the same time, for especially for the first two, two, three years of the NSP program, at the same time that the municipalities and the CDCs were trying to demolish houses, rehabilitate houses, and so forth, the tide of foreclosures in these neighborhoods was still continuing and in some cases increasing. And so you were stemming the bleeding on the one hand, but the bleeding was continuing and growing at the same time with respect to other properties, other blocks, and so forth. So it was extraordinarily difficult to get ahead of the game. And I think one of the reasons why things did improve in a lot of the neighborhoods and areas like the Sun Belt is ironically because at the same time the NSP program was taking place, there was a huge dwarfing the NSP investment by the private market in buying and reoccupying houses. So that in turn relates to the next point, which again, there are extraordinary variations between market conditions. And any program has to be sensitive to these because ultimately, along with how programs change people's perceptions, a central theme about neighborhood change is, again, is there a demand for whatever that neighborhood has to offer in terms of houses and properties? And if you cannot stimulate the demand, then you're not going to be able to change the neighborhood. And even though conceptually I think there was an underlying premise that somehow NSP would do that. It was not articulated, and it was not necessarily a clear part of the strategy that was being pursued by many, if not most, of the grantees. So what this says, ultimately, I think, is that if we're serious about neighborhood revitalization in this country, and I'm not sure that it's the case, but I think we need to be, we really have to move away from the vending machine model and away from thinking about individual interventions as meaningful forms of neighborhood change and start looking at more holistic models. I think in some respects, the Promise Zone program of the current administration represents a thoughtful effort to move in that direction. And I think those kind of programs, but especially programs that also look at the demand issue and look at the question of perception and behavior and integrate that with the physical environment are really the direction there where we have to go. Thank you, Alan. Now we'll turn to Carolina. Great. Thank you, Jill. And uh, thank you, Jill and Jenny, for this terrific report. It's in, uh, almost impossible to try and measure spillover effects, and uh, the report is really impressive for those of you who haven't read it. In my remarks, I'd like to broaden the conversation also a little bit, following on Alan's remarks, to think about how NSP fits into the larger work of community development. And I'm going to try and provide a little bit more of an optimistic look at NSP. 
Um, as Jill, Jenny, and Alan have pointed out, NSP had to swim against the tide against much larger and stronger market forces. This is nothing new for community development. The metaphor swimming against the tide actually comes from an older article by Alice O'Connor, in which she outlines the multiple ways in which place-based community de development initiatives are consistently undermined. Um, by insufficient funding, we always expect community development to do a lot with a little. Short time horizons, uh, we're always asking community development to fix decades of decline in the short and often politically motivated window. Um, and we often sort of don't attend to the structural processes that produce this invested neighborhood to begin with. Um, so this is a story of NSP as well, even more so since it was passed in a time of crisis and constantly shifting sands. So even as we thought and learned new things, the sort of markets moved underneath us in ways that we weren't expecting and it was hard to respond. Um, but the challenges facing low-income neighborhoods existed prior to the foreclosure crisis, and they're going to continue even after the housing market recovers. And for, so for me, the positive impact of MSP is much more visible if we look at the community development angle and the innovations and policy lessons that have emerged from MSP on the ground. And I want to just touch on a few of these. First, I think NSP was critical to building and sustaining nonprofit and local government capacity. As Jenny and Alan both pointed out, capacity in some places was weak, and CDBG offices may have not had that experience with property acquisition and rehab. But if we think about that, and we think about that this was implemented at a time when all other sources of funding were being cut, NSP provided the hard-hit localities with an important source of financing. For example, in both Cleveland and Springfield, nonprofits were able to use NSP to substitute for private debt since the private market players were unwilling to put capital at risk because of market volatility. In other cities, NSP funds helped to jumpstart new initiatives, providing seed capital that could then be used to leverage other foundation funding. This is an important lesson to me. Government and public policy has an important role to play in providing this kind of counter-cyclical funding and financial support to buffer lower income families and communities from these market forces. And I don't want us to forget that, and I don't want us to forget the importance of programs like NSP in times of crisis. Second, NSP helped to expand the reach of non existing nonprofits and city governments by sparking new partnerships and community development infrastructure. Everything from the National Community Stabilization Trust to nonprofits partnering with local public utilities to incorporate green building techniques into their rehab. In order to implement NSP, a whole new range of stakeholders had to develop an understanding of the mortgage servicing business, which will contribute to improved effectiveness of foreclosure prevention and housing counseling programs going forward. Um, Boston Community Capital Fund Initiative, Tucson's Community Land Trust, and Restore Neighborhoods LA are also all examples where NSP catalyzed new community development infrastructure to support the acquisition, rehab, and long-term affordability of homes. I also think NSP has built a stronger coalition of stakeholders that care about mortgage finance. It's not just the affordable home ownership groups paying attention anymore. It's also affordable housing developers and CDBG offices. Um, I think this coalition has been an important advocate for reform, evident in CFPB rulemaking, as well as lobbying for things like the FHA Distressed Asset Purchase Program. Um, NSP also exposed really important financing gaps that I think are starting to be filled or at least being discussed. For example, new hybrid tenure products or scattered site affordable rentals. These weren't part of the conversation five years ago, and now they are. And people are thinking about what kind of portfolio level financing pools are going to be needed to allow strong nonprofits to acquire and finance scattered site rental housing units at scale. I think we have a whole new appreciation of the single family housing stock as a rental stock, and thinking about that and thinking about how do we preserve affordability in single family homes. Third, and finally, some of the most exciting programs coming out of NSP for me align neighborhood stabilization with other community development strategies and needs. Again, just to mention a few, in Connecticut, HDF created the Landlord Entrepreneurship Affordability Program, or LEAP. I think this model is brilliant. Um, it supports the purchase and rehab of small multifamily units by lower income households who then serve as the property's landlord. In my mind, it's a way of preserving affordable housing rental stock 
dealing with the small multifamily stock, which is often problematic and difficult, while at the same time making sure that landlords are members of the community and that lower income families, not investors, benefit from asset ownership and increases in property value. In Chicago, 180 degree properties, which is a, co a collaboration between Mercy Housing Lakefront and the CARA program, combines REO property management with permanent jobs for low income and disadvantaged workers. Again, I think this is really exciting because it's integrating housing and labor market concerns in a new and exciting way. And those are two sectors that are often sort of tackled in silos when we're talking about low-income communities, but that are clearly linked. In Los Angeles, the city tried to align its NSP strategy by buying homes in areas targeted for transit-oriented development with the goal of reducing greenhouse gas emissions and reducing transportation costs for lower-income households. Again, I think you know maybe it wasn't just NSP that sort of fostered these innovations, but it provided a platform to start thinking about it and doing community development in new ways. These initiatives are important because they take NSP one step further than market recovery. NSP lack of impact on property values shouldn't be taken as evidence that the program did not succeed. Stabling house, stabilizing house prices is not necessarily the best measure of community development or positive impact. It doesn't tell us much about how the neighborhood is coming back or whether the families that live there are benefiting from stabilization. In Oakland, where I live, house prices have returned to pre-crisis levels in some neighborhoods, but that's largely due to investor purchases. African American and Latino home buyers are still being shut out of the market. Stabilization, yes, but will these investor-owned homes have a long-term positive community impact or help build the wealth of minority families? What excites me about NSP are the initiatives that have focused on community and building a long-term foundation for change. I want to close by emphasizing that these innovations came from CDC, CDFI, CDBG offices, local governments foundation that have deep roots in the communities that they work in and that understand both market forces and community development. If I could do one thing, it would be to figure out how to sustain investment in these types of organizations. The Capital Magnets Fund is a great start so that we can continue to sustain thoughtful, community-driven, place-based investments over the long term. Thank you. Um. Thank you, Carolina, for pointing to some of the positive um, things that came out of NSP, particularly innovative tools and approaches and building foundations for other things that um, might happen in the future. Um, I also heard um, political will and the, the whole idea that political will um, is needed to spend money on neighborhood revitalization. And however um, inadequate the level of NSP funding may have been, at the same time in the context um, of the economic crisis, um, it was possible to spend some federal grant money um, on this purpose. Um, on the other hand, I think what I heard you say, Alan, was that um, a foreclosure crisis and a program that was narrowly focused on um, foreclosures and um, stemming the tide of foreclosures um, may not have been the best way to think about or approach community development. So, um, so starting with Alan, could you could you talk about that? Is is the is the whole context of a of a stimulus program? Um, the wrong context for trying to do neighborhood um, development? Well, I think it's certainly a difficult context because, and I think Carolina made this point, neighborhood development is a long-term process. And I think you have to look at it that way and provide sustained funding, sustained support, rather than a injection of funds that's going to go away after 18 months or two years or three years. So I think even though the funds were valuable and accomplished some good purposes, the fact that it was not sustained was a major problem. I think the second one was the fact that there was no parallel political will to address the fact that the foreclosures were still going on and that these neighborhoods were continuing to hemorrhage even as CDCs and local governments were trying to you know, deal with vacant properties and foreclosed properties. 
And that, of course, it's a national issue, but it reflects the fact that, again, you have to see what's happening in neighborhoods in a more comprehensive fashion. So I think those were two basic issues, I think, in terms of the problem with trying to approach neighborhood revitalization in this fashion. Um, I'm sorry, go ahead. I was going to say there's also a flip side to political will. On the one hand, is there a political will to provide sustained investment for neighborhoods over the long run to try to combat some of these longer term forces? But cities that have been declining, certainly Cleveland and Detroit have been wrestling with the other side. Is there political will to let some neighborhoods go and to spend the scarce public resources in places that really have a chance to turn around? So this was one of the trade-offs within NSP that the grantees were really encouraged to spend the money in neighborhoods that were at a tipping point where the limited amount of funding available could make a difference. Going into the worst off neighborhoods, there was never going to be enough money to really change those trajectories. But some of the grantees faced a lot of local political pressure to spread the money around even in worst case neighborhoods where realistically they didn't expect to have the same kind of impact. Do you think, um, do you think, Jenny, that that might it might have made a difference if the guidance that came from HUD encouraged um, more strongly focusing resources on neighborhoods that were at a tipping point rather than at the neighborhoods that had been hardest hit by the foreclosure crisis, many of which were these neighborhoods that already were um, weak and had been weak for 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 decades. So, you know, could, could the federal site Go ahead. Given, given the structure of the program, there was only so much that HUD could do. And my understanding is that HUD did, in fact, encourage grantees to be strategic about where they spent the money and not try to fix the places that were probably beyond repair um, or where this, this money really wasn't going to be sufficient. But uh, at, at the end of the day, the grantees had to choose on the ground where they were going to spend the money. And as you pointed out, they had difficulty even in targeting it within areas that they that were already on their list. Um, they really wound up being opportunistic, and I think in part the the neighborhoods that maybe were closer to the tipping point would have been more expensive. They had more competition from investors, and so it was harder for them to acquire their properties. Whereas the areas that really had lots and lots of vacant properties, nobody was going after them, and it wound up just being easier for them to go into those areas. Carolina, you focus on the community development and community developer um, space and communities. Um, what, how, how, how does one go about um, getting community developers to focus on the neighborhoods where there's the biggest chance of actually making a difference? So I think it's very, I think that the framing of this is complicated, right? Because on the one hand, those neighbor on the one hand, we don't have actually enough data and understanding of what neighborhoods are actually tipping and not tipping and what it would take to tip them, right? So I think that, that that's a construct that we think we know, but I don't, I'm not sure that we do. And I would argue that it's better to place resources in those communities that have been disinvested for decades. Those are the communities that we have sort of a, a moral obligation to and that need the resources. So it's possible that the tipping neighborhoods would have sort of tipped positively once the market recovered anyway and these larger structural forces would have sort of, you know, the economy would have improved. So I'm not sure if I actually believe the construct that we need to target investments in these tipping neighborhoods. I'd like to see us really develop a sustained investment in places like Sandtown, Baltimore, and these neighborhoods that sort of really need investments from multiple fronts. Um, and I think, so to answer your question more specifically, I think for community development organizations that are embedded in these neighborhoods and who are deeply tied to residents, thinking about their neighborhood as one that has sort of, you know, lost all hope is just not feasible. I think Alan's earlier point, too, about maybe we need to think about a holistic approach to neighborhoods. This was a HUD program. This was focused on housing. Uh, and that's completely understandable. It was a foreclosure crisis, and that was the, the impetus for the program. But you know, the alternative is 
to have more flexible money that communities can spend on different things. So maybe they needed some money to spend demolishing vacant properties, but maybe they also needed to be spending money on the transportation infrastructure, or in Detroit's case, shoring up the policing and emergency services. And so this was always going to be money that could only be used for some purposes that are relevant to community development, but many of the neighborhoods that, uh, that Carolina is talking about could probably have used the money for things other than housing-related purposes, and those might have been just as useful or more useful to residents in the long run, job training, education, et cetera, that were never going to be eligible for NSP funds. I think that's an excellent point, and it comes back to this idea that this was a program that was developed in a period of crisis and really was around you know, market stabilization and maybe not community development broadly defined. Though that raises, I think, another question, and it's interesting that you mentioned Sandtown in Baltimore because I think the fascinating thing about Sandtown is that this was the neighborhood that probably had the largest and most comprehensive effort intervention at neighborhood stabilization of pro almost any neighborhood in the United States during the 90s. And obviously, it didn't work in the sense, I think part of it is the underlying challenge about place-based interventions to begin with, that if you're in a neighborhood where the people who live in that neighborhood really don't have confidence in the neighborhood's future, that even if you start improving people's lives with educational advantages, job opportunities, training, better job access, all of these kinds of things, they may very well move out of that neighborhood, which kind of creates a, a circular process. So I think that's another aspect of this, that you know, improving a place is critical, improving people's lives is critical, but how you connect those two in such a way that people and place are linked is still an incredibly complicated process. Was, was the Sandtown neighborhood simply too big, Alan? Um, would, it, would that intervention have been more successful had it been more focused on an area of just a few square blocks? I don't know. I mean, but that's, that's an important question. Is I don't know that anybody has done the kind of systematic going back and analyzing that whole experience, which I think would be very valuable because it was a huge effort. But I think the question of scale, and, and this is something that sort of goes through the literature a lot, is what is the critical mass of investment or intervention in something before you start to see spillovers? Well, and and then it's, also, yeah. Oh, sorry, and I was gonna, yeah. please finish your thought. No, I was, it's just going to mutter something along the lines of saying it's very difficult to pin that down. Yeah. No, and I agree, but I also think that it comes back to that point where we were making about NSP, right? That, you know, you were trying to reclaim vacant and abandoned properties on the one hand, and at the other hand, we didn't have an effective loan modification program to help prevent foreclosures, additional foreclosures. You know, we try and invest in a place like Sandtown, but we don't have strong labor market reforms, living wage ordinances, investments in that sort of larger education infrastructure that then sort of the, those macro structures that then help to support the investments in the neighborhood. Well, Choice Neighborhoods is clearly an example of an effort to be holistic and to operate at scale. Um, one of the reasons that it's possible to target to a fairly focused is the choice neighborhoods is sort of centered around either public housing or other large assisted multi-housing, multi-family housing developments. Um, from what any of the three of you knows about how the choice neighborhoods um, program is going, would you do, do we have some early lessons about whether whether that is a more effective um, um, kind of intervention? Jenny, do you want to take that or or anybody? I don't think we have um, that much evidence yet on how the choice neighborhoods are working. I think that's still too early to say. I mean, we certainly have models previously that have been done around um, 
large public housing developments around anchor institutions, and there is something to be said for putting additional resources into places where there are both institutions that can shore up neighborhood and existing relationships. Um, you know, going back to the issue of capacity, there are the, the grantees that use NSP money um, most most effectively, most efficiently, were the ones that had existing relationships in the neighborhoods and that were able to build on their prior work. They already had essentially a long-term uh, development, a community or, or housing redevelopment agenda for the place, and they essentially used this funding for projects that they'd already decided they wanted to do. So they weren't going out and looking for places to spend the money, they already knew that. Uh, and the choice neighborhoods, I think, are also building on that, places where there's a strategy in place and it's just additional coordination of funds rather than a new effort altogether. One of the issues with the foreclosure crisis was that it hit neighborhoods that hadn't necessarily faced uh, these kinds of circumstances before, both working with single family scattered site housing and in neighborhoods that the local governments didn't have the ties, made it more difficult for them to carry out their, uh, their activities. So, so, Alan, you talked about the different kinds of neighborhoods that were the focus of NSP2. Um, was it wrong to include these um, Sunbelt neighborhoods that were so heavily hit by the foreclosure crisis but that were not long-term distressed neighborhoods? Was that a, a misguided focus of the NSP program? Oh, I would say absolutely not. For one thing, at the time, NSP was devised, and I remember this very well because I've spent quite a bit of time in Las Vegas over the period since the bust began. People in these neighborhoods and in these cities and metros <coughs> were absolutely paralyzed by the fear of what I think one person referred to as Detroitification, and the feeling that they were heading to straight down the tubes. Now, it turned out that it wasn't so, but it was clear that some kind of intervention was needed in these areas to try to shore up both you know, the, the neighborhoods from a physical standpoint as well as just the confidence that people had in the future of these areas. Now, what was not predicted and I can speak specifically to Las Vegas, but I think it was very similar in other Sunbelt communities, that starting roughly about the same time as NSP was really starting to gather steam, we saw a massive flow of private dollars, almost entirely from very small-scale sources, buying single-family housing as medium and long-term rental investments. And I know I did a back of the envelope estimate of how much went into the Vegas metro between 2009 and 2012, just in single family acquisition by investors. And the number is $25 billion, which dwarfs, of course, the amount of NSP money that was available at the same time. So I don't think it was a mistake it's not clear to me how much NSP contributed to the fact that these neighborhoods, by and large, have turned around. But I certainly don't think that it was wrong to have put that money into those neighborhoods. Um, even though the, the, the evaluation seems to have suggested, the, uh, by, by using comparison um, census tracts, seem to, seems to suggest that um, those areas were going to recover anyway because they were we're going to get the private investment that would make them recover anyway. I mean, if this, yeah. you know, if if we got, you know, if if we were, and I of course I hope we don't, but if we were to have another such foreclosure crisis, would you still say that um, that the program should, should focus on all types of neighborhoods um, as long as they hard hit and the and 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 had a very high concentration of foreclosures? Not necessarily. That's a good point. But of course, you know, the problem is no crisis ever looks just enough like the last one to make it that easy to draw lessons. Can I, this is Carolina. I, 
again, to go back to my sort of uh, one of the things that NSP did do was build community development capacity. I actually think it was really important in places like Stockton and Las Vegas and Fresno and areas that have historically not been places that have had to deal with vacant and abandoned properties or that don't have necessarily a super strong community development infrastructure. But we know that the landscape of poverty is shifting. We know that we're seeing a suburbanization of poverty. And so maybe one positive to come out of this is building capacity in those kind of places to think about community development, to think about housing, and to think strategically about how you do investments in communities. Well, that, that it raises in my mind the issue of um, what is it that you're, you, you need to do to the housing stock um, in order to um, turn a neighborhood around or, or put a neighborhood on the path to recovery. Um, one of the uh, points that I took from the report when I looked it over again is that um, the rehabilitation done was often um, done to very high standards so that the resources of the program were, you know, were heavily focused on particular properties. Um, is, is that appropriate or, or should lighter rehab or, um, or um, acquisition by new homeowners of a, of a larger amount of the housing stock in a, in a neighborhood, is that a more effective strategy, at least in some places? I think a slightly different question. Uh, the NSP program was at least initially focused very much on the single family stock because that's where the foreclosures were concentrated. But that's a relatively new area for many of the local governments. Uh, some of the nonprofit grantees, for instance, Habitat for Humanity, of course, have been doing that for a long time. But for the public agencies, that's really a new world. And I think another way to think about it is, should we be spending the public money on owner occupancy, um, which is you know, which is going to be a slightly different population, um, and essentially turning these properties over because the idea was to do the rehab and then sell them to other buyers, or see it as an opportunity to acquire maybe multifamily rental properties and lock in long-term affordability, especially for some of the Sunbelt communities where affordability is usually the bigger problem and vacancies are not. Um, so, for instance, in places like Los Angeles um, or in places like Phoenix, maybe to acquire properties that are going to be in the portfolio so that when the housing market recovers, um, that there's additional affordable stock that wouldn't have been there otherwise. So, I think what I hear you saying is that as long as this money was being spent in those neighborhoods that the local planner should have anticipated that those uh, that those neighborhoods had underlying health and therefore used this opportunity to address the affordability issue. Yes, I think that's right. Yeah. I think in some of the communities, oh, sorry, just quickly in terms of Jill's earlier question, in some of the communities that I worked in, um, one of the challenges in terms of having the nonprofit not doing the rehab themselves to a higher level was that the buyers couldn't get financing to do the rehab. So banks wouldn't underwrite to that financing, the rehab financing. And so it was a catch-22 that you couldn't have home buyers move into properties that were not suitable for living if they couldn't get financing to rehab them themselves. Yeah. I think a couple of other points on the question of the housing stock. One is in terms of dealing with vacancies, and this I think was an underlying problem. I mean, there's a fair amount of research as well as just common sense that suggests all it really takes is one vacancy on a block to start having a negative impact. And if you have five vacant houses on a block and you manage with huge effort to acquire and rehab three of them, but you still have two left, you're not likely to get a significant change in that block's trajectory. So that's one issue that just is a kind of a central problem in a lot of these neighborhoods, especially in the ones in the older cities which have problems of chronic vacancy. A second, I think the other issue which a lot of people had trouble with in the NSP program was the fact that the original model that the CDCs were pursuing was to rehabilitate these houses for sale to moderate income home buyers. 
which in many cases was a very rational strategy given the dynamics of the neighborhoods. But then they found that their home buyers wouldn't be able to qualify for mortgages, and huge numbers of the units that were originally intended to be owner-occupied ended up being rented out either as a long-term or a hopefully short-term strategy, at which point then another problem kind of was plugged in that very few CDCs either had or felt comfortable trying to develop the capacity for to manage scattered site rental housing, which is admittedly a difficult proposition. So a lot of these things sort of interwove to, again, have, despite the fact that you know there was positive movement in terms of a lot of individual properties, that the spillovers were not likely to happen. I think that's a really good reminder of the way that some of the things that didn't work as well as hoped about NSP maybe could have been foreseen and some of them couldn't. So the difficulty in finding qualified home buyers was in, in part because banks tightened their lending standards. Exactly. Recession. And maybe that could have been foreseen, um, but I don't think anybody really anticipated the degree to which it was going to be harder for people to qualify for loans. Even, even not low-income borrowers were having a hard time qualifying. Uh, and you know, had they known that in advance, the grantees might have chosen to focus on different kinds of properties or different neighborhoods in the beginning. But I think a lot of that really was beyond their capacity to foresee at the beginning. Well, Carolina, you talked about the the um, thinking about the single family stock as potentially rental stock as one of the um, innovations um, that came out of of, of NSP. Um, what do any of the panelists think about um, a rental neighborhood or a heavily rental neighborhood as potentially a healthy neighborhood? I think it's a real long shot. It depends a lot on the location. I mean, certainly a lot of the larger central cities are heavily rental. I mean, New York is two-thirds rental properties, and I don't think we consider New York to be not a healthy housing market, uh, or at least not in that direction. Uh, but it really does vary, it, it, and I think it's less the level of rental than the change. So neighborhoods that have been heavily owner-occupied and rapidly turned into rental neighborhoods are going to have a very different dynamic. Yeah. Yeah. And that was part of what we saw, and you know, certainly many of the investors, private investors that were buying up properties, did intend to be responsible landlords and were maintaining the properties, but not all of them were, and so the, the quality of properties that were purchased by private investors varies a lot, and that has real implications for the stability of the neighborhood yeah. transitioning to renter. Yeah. If I can add to that, I would say, when I, my comment, by the way, was about neighborhoods that were basically single-family house neighborhoods as distinct from multifamily housing. The, the very, the few neighborhoods outside of New York City that are multifamily neighborhoods, which are a very different animal. But I think whether the investors were more likely to be responsible or predatory tended to have, again, a lot to do with the nature of the market in the area. The investors in Las Vegas that I studied were, as a rule, at some reasonable level, responsible investors. They wanted to maintain the value of their investment. They hoped to sell it five or ten years down the road for a profit. They were trying to be responsible about it and tended to respond to problems fairly well. The investors that I've looked at in a city like Detroit were a totally different type of animal. They were buying houses for fifteen or twenty thousand dollars, putting minimal money into them, renting them out, not paying the property taxes with the idea that they would make a killing in three or four years and then walk away. So it was very heavily driven by the market conditions, which of course becomes another issue that CDCs or local governments working with programs like NSP have to take into account, that market conditions not only affect what they're doing, but they affect what's going on around them. We've got only a couple of minutes before we have to end. I'd like to ask um, any of the panelists who wants to, to make a closing observation about where you think the community development field is headed from here. 
Carolina. <laughs> uh, I was hoping somebody else would go first. <laughs> uh, I mean, I think we are constantly learning. I do think that initiatives like Choice show that we can learn from HOPE 6. I think that a lot of community development groups have learned from NSP and have become more sophisticated in all sorts of ways. I think we've identified interesting financing product gaps and products. So I think all that is positive. I think the challenge remains that getting, securing funding for place-based initiatives still proves to be really difficult. And I would say the thing that's going to limit the impact of choice is the lack of funding for it. Um, so I, I think figuring, I think researchers need to do a better job of figuring out how to make place-based investments work to move away from this vending machine model that Alan was talking about and then unlocking more funds for it. I'll just second that. I think a lot of CDCs learned a lot from NSP, and I th it was a, you know, it was a lifesaver for many of them, keeping keeping them going and making them able to do things and be creative during a difficult period. I think the tr real problem at this point is where is the funding, especially the sustained funding, going to come from to keep up. NSP has in many cases begun. I know home is at risk of being all but zeroed out, and there doesn't seem to be anything new emerging on the horizon. So I think that's going to be the biggest challenge again. How can we keep up whatever momentum and whatever learning we got out of the NSP experience? Jenny, any concluding thoughts? Sure. You know, I, I think all of us keep coming back to the idea that the resources from the public sector are very limited, and that's unlikely to change in the near future. Given that, the public sector needs to think very carefully about what it can and should do that the private sector won't, or ways to be leveraging private capital um, and not trying to fix everything at itself. So again, being strategic about where you think it can matter. I think we have to have very realistic expectations about what the limited public capital can do and either scaling down uh, the intended targets or um, you know, trying, trying to figure out other ways beyond the public funds to supplement it. And given how limited the funds are, public entities and nonprofits have to be very, very efficient at using the resources. And I think the, you know, the, the biggest loss of NSP was that this was a big chunk of money for some organizations that didn't have the internal capacity or the time and support to use it as efficiently as they could. And some of the money was essentially wasted, and there isn't that much of it. Um, so you know, again, I don't know how much of that could have been foreseen and prevented up front, but every penny really has to do its maximum job, given that there's not that much money to go around. Well, I want to thank all three panelists. I think this has been a very interesting, thought-provoking discussion. Um, a recording will be available for downloading, um, and the, the, the director of the neighborhood uh, of the NSP evaluation was Alvaro Cortez. If anyone um, in the audience would like to know more about the study or has any follow-up questions, here's Alvaro's email on this screen, um, as well as I guess what this is is um, App's Twitter address. But in any case, thank you all very much for participating, and thank, I want to thank all three panelists. I think this was very interesting indeed. Thank you, Joe. Thank, thank you. you.